all right so let's get started so today's topic is going to be javascript basics of javascript the language uh, we will try to focus on the language and uh, not so much on jquery and dom manipulation etc we might do a little bit of that but that won't be the main focus the main focus is the ins and out of javascript the language because there are a few things that you should know okay so let me share my screen okay you probably can see this hopefully um okay so here's what i have let me remove all this uh we're going to start over completely okay so let me just delete this okay and start all right so i have a new terminal and as you can see in behind i have visual studio code vs code that is uh, installed this is on linux so yes you can get vs code for linux okay so what i'm going to do is i'm going to create a simple to to learn javascript and to run javascript and do anything um, there are multiple ways of doing that but the the one that is applicable available to everybody is a browser browser is has a built in um built in capability there right so um, to run javascript so we'll go to dev web learn I have created a directory there's nothing in it it's completely empty so i basically say file in in vs code you say file open folder and then you say okay let's open learn so that's the folder it i learn opened i'm going to create an html file some javascript etc okay let's see um so open a new create start a new file again this is vs code okay so this is html i say doc and then i press tab it opens in doc type i say html containing head containing and uh, head and body let's say press tab oops no press tab so yeah sometimes there is something strange so so it oh, so what what did i just do this this syntax where i'm saying html is greater than head let me make it a little simpler first so you you have html you press tab it it turns it into a tag this is called emmet or zen coding also this guy emmet okay uh so that that is nice to have undo that and if you want to say html open an html tag and within, within that open a head tag and within that open a title tag then you can just press tab like that so this is basically like a css selector you're typing a css selector if you know css then you will know that html having an immediate child head that having an immediate ti ti child title uh, the the css selector for that is html greater than head greater than title this is the css selector for this title so emmet simply uses the css selector kind of thing to um to expand things so all right we'll say learn javascript let's say at the title okay then you want to have a body right so we say body and let's put a heading 1 h1 and the text of that heading 1 is learn javascript press tab and it expands like this nice huh so this is called yeah Yeah so this is called uh, uh, zen coding is the concept and this particular plugin is called emmet 
that's the name of the plugin. Okay. All right. So then you want to say, I want to open a script tag. We just said script, press tab, and then it does this. Okay. So what first thing you need to know about JavaScript, it is a, it's an inter interpreted programming language. So obviously any language that used to be interpreted in the past, now it is called, it's a VM a virtual machine based language. So it's executed by the JavaScript virtual machine, right? Uh, it's pretty much the same as any interpreter. Okay. So, uh, the funny thing is that this interpreter or the VM, the JavaScript execution engine is built into every browser and that's what makes it so interesting. All right. So, uh, what can we do in JavaScript? The easiest thing that we can do is uh, we used to do alert. Alert will say hello. This is JavaScript. But pretty soon you'll realize that this is pretty annoying. It gets very annoying. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that. I save this. Now to run this, there are two ways to run it. One is I could just open this file directly in a browser. So, right, um, I can tell Chrome to open it directly as a file. So I could say, okay, open and dev web learn index. So uh, if I open it, it will open it, right? But that's not how I would like to do it because I want certain things to happen like a real web server to serve it. So you can fortunately do that if you have PHP. You can run PHP minus capital S hostname, localhost that is 8080. Okay. So if you say this, remember I'm in the learn directory, remember, right? So if you see index.html is right there. So if I run PHP, basically I'm saying run a, run a web server, a mini web server at localhost 8080. This is obviously not uh, good for production servers, but for development, this is great. Press enter. Now it says listening on localhost 8080. So you can open that link and that link is saying, hello, this is JavaScript. And that was an alert, right? So did you notice how the alert came up and then learn JavaScript came up? So that's fine. The, the point is alerts can become very annoying very quickly. So that's why you don't want to do alert. You want to say console.log. That is much nicer because when you do that and then you reload this, nothing, nothing annoying happens, but then nothing happens also because you cannot see that message. So I'm sure you guys know where to find, see that message. Can anybody tell me where to see the message? How do I go? How do I go there? That's right. Control shift I or inspect element. Both are the same thing. And then tab, click on console. So there it is. Hello, this is JavaScript. So this is, this will be helpful for us to uh, print some debugging information, etc. etc. Okay. Let's now go back to, so now that we know how to print something in JavaScript, uh, let's keep going. Uh, now, JavaScript, first thing I want to tell you is that Java, uh, uh, there is a very short and interesting, simple um, uh, tutorial here, uh, over here. So I like, I like this tutorial. It's a very basic tutorial. It's very short. Let me show you. Uh, Developer.mozilla.org. I can, I can put this in the chat window also. Let me do that. It's nothing fantastic, okay? It's not going to make you a JavaScript expert, but it is, it's good to start. Start with, okay? So that is, okay. So that, that, if you go to that um, page, it says, what is JavaScript really? Hello world example. And it, it 
basically it, it actually it injects the output into the into the query selector uh, into the document itself heading text content equal to something okay so according to these guys what you should do is you should uh, um, let's say you say h2 and it give it an id of whatever uh, i don't know what should I call it? X. Let's call it X. So you press tab on that, so it becomes the ID, and then you say this will be replaced. So far, I mean, you guys have done JavaScript a little bit at least, so it won't be very interesting. So you just say document dot query selector. So this is this used to be the exclusive domain of jQuery, and but now it's built into uh, the primary JavaScript itself, and then you say, "Okay, find me something by ID X," and then its text content replace that whatever text content it is. Just replace it with this came from JavaScript. Okay. If you do this, let's see what happens. Oops, where is my Rerun, it got replaced. I mean, obviously, you may say, "Hey, wait a second. I mean, originally it was uh, this will be replaced, but then as soon as you looked at it, it was already replaced, right?" So, in order to see what it was before all that happened, you can basically go to sources, and in sources, you go to you open that source. Well, index itself has some JavaScript right there, right? You put a breakpoint here. Because your your JavaScript is inside index.html, you can open an index file itself and put a breakpoint in there. So now, if I reload, watch what happens. You see how it says this will be replaced because it has not been replaced. Okay. So what's he saying? Serving from your file system. Add your files into into what? Into the workspace, if you add files to into DevTools workspace, your changes will be persisted to disk. To add a folder into the workspace, drag and drop it into the sources panel. Okay, all right, that's good. So we'll we'll, we'll do it later. But anyway, so let's just uh, continue. So now this is still saying this will be replaced. As soon as you say step over, it got replaced. Now you can. Continue. So the JavaScript debugger is built directly into Chrome DevTools. In fact, it's built into most browsers these days. Uh, did did everybody know that you could debug JavaScript live inside the Chrome browser? Like put a breakpoint and all. Okay, have you used it? Cool, very nice. Okay, well for those who didn't, now you know. Okay, so uh, so that's so far we are not learning JavaScript itself, the language. We are just learning the mechanics of how it integrates into the browser, etc. Let's get into JavaScript itself. So JavaScript, as you can see here, in, it has variables. Variables can be uh, mentioned without a prefix, in which case they become, I think. Uh, I believe they, they become global, but I, I'm not so sure. Anyway, I never uh, declare my variables without the var prefix. So I always put var in front of it. So you can say var x equal to whatever, say 10, in which case x is an in integer. Well, actually, JavaScript does not have an integer versus a uh, floating point, etc. It has only a, a type called number. Okay, number. Numeric type. That's it. Uh, it uh, so it's a number. It's not a floating point and, or an integer, which makes for very interesting situations. By the way, it has strings, as you might imagine. It has booleans, which is true and false. It has arrays, which are very very interesting arrays. They are good. So as you can see, arrays are not specifically typed arrays. You can mix and match. It, the elements of the array can be of any type. 
there is no specific type that you have to put in an array. Unlike Java and C and C++ and most other uh, compiled languages, they'll force you to have uh, uniform arrays, arrays with the same type inside. Not so in JavaScript. Then finally, there's object. Now you will notice uh, pretty soon you might notice that objects are almost same as associative arrays and you will we will learn about that associative arrays and, and objects are almost interchangeable so so let's let's see so we say num 1 10 right but uh, let's say str1 is this is string you put them in either single quotes or double quotes both are valid i generally like double quotes i don't know why but I just do. Okay. Um, I'll tell you why I like uh, single quotes. So did I say double quotes? I, I meant single quotes. Um, what did I say? Okay. I should have said single. Yeah, I like single quotes. The reason why I like single quotes is um, because in most other languages like uh, PHP and Kotlin and Groovy and many others, a single quotes indicates uh, strings that are hard strings and they don't interpolate, they don't uh, they don't expand variables, they don't substitute variable values, while double quotes uh, quoted strings do. And this way, uh, when I put single quotes, I know that this thing is not going to get re uh, replaced with variable values in there. So like you, if, you, if you had you know, dollar, uh, dollar num in there, it won't be expanded. And I wanted that. So, so that's a string. Then there is a boolean, uh, true or false or whatever you want to give it. Then there is an array, a1 equals, in square bracket, you know, 1a, you know, false, whatever, uh, etc. Okay. So that, that, all that is um, an array. And finally, object, o1 is, you say curly braces. You give a, a property name, a member, m1 is value 1, and 2 is 5, something. So that's an object. So an object, uh, let me show another object, O2 is, you could, if your property had, so remember, this is a key and it has no quotes around it. But you can have quotes, and you must actually, if you are going to put special characters. So you could say m space one, m space one is v one. Okay, and then m underscore two. So this is a different object. Now we had to put single quotes around this because there is a space in the middle. But this is a property of the object. So you could say o2 dot m space, space 1 but then that would have to be. So now in order to uh, uh, you can reference the values like o1 dot m1 and then o1 dot m2 but here you cannot do that. You will have to say o2 you cannot say dot m1 uh, I don't think you can. So the, the correct way to say it is put it in single quotes, but then put square bracket instead of dot. And then for O2, you still say M underscore because that is syntactically correct. So do you get the, the, I hope you got the point about when you have special characters within the name of the property, it, you, you write it as an associative error. Not only that, actually the, this, this property can be a variable. So it is completely okay to say um, property is equal to m space 1 and then access it using o2 p. It refers to same thing. Meaning to say the, uh, the index of that associative array can be a variable. And that variable 
determines which property you are and it resolves to this property. Am I making sense? This is, yeah, this is a bit unusual. You are almost never ever accessing the property of a very uh, of, a, of an object where the property name itself is a variable that very rarely ever happens right your, your property names usually are member names are fixed they are determined at at uh, at the time of writing the code but in this case the the which property you're accessing is a, is a runtime decision okay Okay, so these are the various kinds of variables. Now, uh, one thing that you need to learn about arrays is that you can, arrays can are dynamically growing. So you can go to a, let's just first console dot log a1. Okay, let's do that. By the way, yeah, we don't need this. Okay, so if I run this, so there's your console.log logging the array itself, right? So this is fine, but here's the fun part. You can, you can then say, okay, a1 dot, uh, if you wanted to change the first member, uh, let's say, is it? So as you should by now be used to it, that arrays are, they begin at which index? The numerically indexed arrays start at what number? That's right, zero, not one. Okay. So A0 refers to this guy. Okay. So if I say A0 is now five, and then A A1, sorry, A11 is now, which used to be a string, by the way. Now you're making it a number. And let's make this one a string. Right? And now if you print console log a1, and that's completely fine, okay? So this is fine. And I'll say this is me showing you that, that you can just go to any index in an array and change it. But in the, that's not all. You could even say a1, so how many, a, it has four values, right? So you go to six, position number six, and then you assign some value there. If you save that and print it. So look, you got zero, the position zero, one, two, three, and then four and five are empty, but six has a value. Six. And look at the length, length is seven. Mm -hmm. Which, so this would be considered in most other programming language, we would call this a sparse array. Sparse array. So if you did some data structures in computer science, then you would have learned about sparse array. Sparse array is an array which has uh, elements at which are not contiguously located, there are empty spaces between elements. So that was an example of the sparse array. But that's not what I want to show you. What I want to show you is even better. You could say, a now that you have six or seven elements in this case, you could now say, or any, at any point you could say just push and you can append a value. Okay. And when you do that, it pushed this value at position seven. So it a, an array is automatically treated also available as a stack. So push, just like you can do push, you can also do pop. A1 dot pop, and that gives you the new value. This uh, pop value, and you can console log a1 and also console log the pop value. 
Okay, so guys, if you are totally bored and falling asleep, let me know. Uh, these things are too too basic. So then you got um, so hold on. You pushed a value, then you popped it, so it disappeared from there. Then you're then when you popped it, it came back as whatever the value was, which is pushed value, right? So that's what it's printing. Are you with me so far? I mean, is this too easy? Right, right. No, that's not the uh, point I'm making about JavaScript. I mean, did you know these things existed? Push and pop. Okay. All right. Good. Good then. Okay. Now let's talk. So, so yeah, that's that's all I want to say about objects and arrays. Objects are uh, indicated with curly braces, and then arrays with square brackets. Okay. All right. So now that's the extent of all this. Now let's go to. Let me just. Uh, Yeah, so so if I want to put this away and put this in, turn this into a, a comment, I just say ang, uh, angle bracket exclamation sign dash dash, and I can close it with dash dash. So this is a comment. I'm not sure if you knew that that's how HTML comments they start like this and they end like this. Okay. Right, so let's uh, open a new script. I want. I'm going to change the subject a little bit, right? So next, I want to show you the variable scope. Okay, so variable x equal to say 15. And if you have a function, so this is the first time I'm using a function. Let's call it function f1, and it simply says console dot log x, you know, print x basically, right? So let's uh, run that. But we forgot to call f1, right? And this console.log will not be called until you actually call f1. So one way is to actually call f1, like, like this, right? But I have a better idea. Why don't we, since in this page, f1 has been defined, can we not just call f1 like that? So in JavaScript console, you can actually execute JavaScript code and it works. So f1 ran, it printed 15. And does anybody know why it says undefined here? <laughs> what is that undefined? Where did that come from? The answer is, whenever you run an expression, whenever you evaluate an expression, this expression is a function, so it, so it ran and it printed 15, yes, but then the value of the expression, the return value of that function is nothing. Therefore, that is undefined. So the value of this whole expression is undefined. That's what it prints. So just like if I print 1 plus 2, the value of that expression is 3. So it printed 3. I, I didn't ask it to print three. I only asked it to add one and two. But it did that and it, and it prints every time it evaluates an expression. So, so this is how I, uh, so this part, so what I want to show you is the fact that even though X is not defined within this function F1, F1 does have access to X, right? And when it prints, it prints 15. Now, if I go in here and create a new variable x, it call, also call it x, but give it a value of 5. Now when I run this function, this x now refers to this x and not this one. That's why when I, even, even uh, VS, VS Code basically told me that you're talking about this one, right? It didn't... Uh, it recognized that these two x's are same while this x is something else. As soon as I, I delete this line and I put focus on this x, it, it highlights the other x. 
So now these two x's are same. But as soon as I add this line back, this x refer to the local variable x and not the outside local. Okay. So that is again not very interesting. Let's reload. And if we call f1 again, this time it prints 5, this value, not this value. And this is to show you that what variable scope, etc. is. Now, on the other hand, as soon as you print console log x from outside, which means outside the function, now this x refers to the global x. If I now run this again, so it printed 15 already because it, so this is one thing that you need to realize. Whatever code is at the top level, it will execute, it will just run. While this one didn't run, because its job is not to run function f1, its job is to define function f1. Nowhere do we actually call for f1, we only define f1. So in order, to, if you want to call, we'll call it, which means you run f1 like this. So when you want to call a function, you have to give it parentheses and uh, some parameters. And if it takes no parameters, then empty parentheses. Okay, so then it, so that's variable scoping. This is outer scope, this is inner scope. Okay, now let's do one more thing. Let's create an if statement. And we just say if x is greater than four, which means it is, it will be true, right? Then in here we say var y equal to six. And now if we try to print x followed by y, let's say we try to print y. Okay, let's see what happens. Reload. Does anybody think that we will print y or not? So y is in this scope of if only. Yeah, there is no, like it's not in this outer scope. Do you think y is valid here? So if, if this was C or Java, it would definitely be invalid. It won't, it would give an a compile error. But in JavaScript, this is the thing you need to know that JavaScript variables are hoisted. Hoisted means block level variables get hoisted to function level. So this is almost saying like that. Of course, there is only an if statement, right? So, um, so if there was an else, it would run. And you, if you, there you said y, var y equals seven, it would run. But again, uh, that will depend on the value of x. Okay. But either way, both the va variables get hoisted. There is the basically whether the, it is this y or this y, they are both in reality, referring to a y at a higher scope. Why, why at this scope? Because that is the function level. Now let, so just, just be making you understand that in, in JavaScript, there is no, no, no real sense of a block level scope. All scope is function level. Okay. Oh, I don't know if that makes sense. Go ahead, simple. Yes, in, yes, yes, closest inner. That's a very good question. So if there was another function, which of course is possible in JavaScript, if you had F2 and you had a var, you know, Z, you know, now the Z does not get host hoisted to this level because this is still a function. So it goes up to the function level. It gets hoisted only to function level, not to parent function level. Okay. So yeah, that was a good question. Okay, so now that we are in this vicinity, let's talk about, okay. So 
I want you to tell me what is the computer science name of this P1. Oh, sorry, you don't say war at all, you just say P1. What is the in computing sciences, what is P1? Okay, and, and later on, if I call, sorry, that is so true. Uh, you've been paying attention. That's good. Yeah, so, and, and this one, if I say F1 with a parameter of 5, or, or let's say 65. So, what is 65 here? 65 is called. Well, it corresponds with this. So what will happen is when F1 is actually called, then the 65 will get assigned, become the temporary value of P1, and then the rest of the function will run with, with P1 equal to 65. So my question is, just like P1 is called formal parameter, this is called formal parameter, okay? P1 is a formal parameter. So what is 65? Come on, you, you said formal parameter, so it should be very easy for you to tell. There it is, D. No, it's not informal. Uh, this is called actu actual parameter. Uh, I don't think there is such a thing as informal parameter. No. So, so P1 is called the uh, formal parameter and actual parameter, uh, 65 is the actual parameter. And of course, the actual parameter gets assigned to the formal and then the function runs. Okay. All right. So, that's so far so good. Now, uh, we should talk about the fact that in uh, one thing that you... Uh, Joey already mentioned is that the, you can put function inside function and that is completely okay. It's not okay in C, but in JavaScript it's okay. Even in Java, uh, there are inner classes but not inner functions as such, which, uh, so anyway, so JavaScript basically allows you to put function inside function. So the thing is, not only that, you can, you don't have to have a name for the function. You can omit the name. So here, this is an anonymous function. The problem with this is that this anonymous function comes into existence and then poof, disappears. That means you wrote a function for no good reason at all. I mean, if you're never going to use it, if you're never going to call it, what's the point of a function? Right. So you know. So how should how can you call a function like this? Well, you can assign it to a variable. So this is almost the same thing, right, as before, except that you the function is still anonymous function, but then that anonymous function value gets assigned to a variable called f1. So that is different. So now it is completely valid to then reassign f1 equal to 7. This is okay. Okay. Of course, then. Uh, which function? Uh, do you mean f1 or this anonymous function? Yes, it is an object. Yes. Uh, you're right. But it's a function object. It's an object of type function. So yes, it is an object. Okay, make sense. So you could you could actually do this. You could say cons. So because this this thing is called f1, right? A variable. Let me run this. Let me run this. It ran just like you would. You can call it just like. Oh, sorry. You have to give it a parameter. Right. So it. It did that. It doesn't do actually print anything. So let's just print console dot log. Let's say p one. So reload, and it works. Okay. But the funny thing is, 
it's actually a variable. So as a variable, you can print the value of a variable. <laughs> and that's the value of the variable. Okay. So why why you because you did not evaluate the function, you did not call the function. So this is calling the function. Well, while without parameters, it's just tell me the value of this function. So now you're treating function as a value. And that's the other thing you need to know that JavaScript functions are values. Which means which means they can be assigned. <laughs> so remember, you're not calling a function and assigning the return value to a variable. You're assigning the function itself to a variable. Okay. All right. So far, so good. Any questions about this? Okay. A very good question. It's an excellent question. So imagine that you had you had a variable called strategy okay and it it has no value but then you have a few functions like uh, function uh, let's say high risk so you're writing high risk strategy uh, investing strategy basically is what what this is okay so something goes on here, right? Some some kind of investing, okay? Function, another one, low risk strategy. Okay, then function, medium risk. So now, what is the benefit? The benefit is that at runtime, you can decide what strategy you want to use. So you just say strategy equal to I risk. So you don't call it, you just say this. Now, of course, you could, the, so because functions are values, yeah, I could completely uh, say, say like this, okay. Th that's not the point I'm making. You could say one or the other, they're, they're same. But the point I'm making is that because functions are, uh, are values, you can just assign it like this. And now, here's the fun part. You can now call strategy, so although it's a value, you can call it like a function. Because strategy is a value which is assigned the value of a function, it will end up calling that function. Make sense? Now you may say, oh, no, it doesn't make sense. Well, what's the point here? The point is you could be, uh, you could be reading this value, which strategy to use could be coming from the user, right? So, oh uh, wait, what was this? Uh, JavaScript user prompt. Mm -hmm. You could say, you could ask the user for which strategy to use. So, so you could basically say, you could put these in, a, in an array. You could say, hey, strategy zero is this. Strategy one is this. Strategy two is this one. And now you don't even need to give it names. Okay. And then finally, you could say, hey, take whichever strategy was chosen by the user, and you can say chosen equal to prompt. Go dot prompt. Yes. 
factors. Make sense? So now let me see. Well, we'll, we'll put a put a um, console log in here, right? Console log strand A. So with that, if I Cannot set property of undefined 36. Sorry. Yeah, so what I should do is I should assign it an empty array. Okay, so, so strategies are empty. Now we can, I can start populating it. So I reload it says enter strategy number. Say one. It used strategy B. Once again, let me reload enter strategy number. Let's say zero and click A. See that? I say reload again and I enter strategy number of two. Pick C. Does that make it interesting? It is, it, it's, yeah, it's basically picking which, which, what, what, what operation to perform based on what input you give it. And it is, there is no if then else switch case statement. There is just an array. And you are picking indexes within the array, and based on which index you enter, the corresponding element is a function, and that function is being executed. And all of that is happening because of this. You know, you you're going into the strategy array, and indexing it by with chosen chosen strategy, whatever the user entered, and then you're calling it like a function. Just by by putting parentheses behind that variable itself, uh, behind that value, you are calling it like a function. Okay. Yes, it is like case switch. Yep, it, it is sort of like, except that uh, the, the you don't have to write the case switch. You, you could have a million elements in this, and it would be just there would be no. In case switch, you would have to actually say uh, switch chosen, and you would have to say case zero, do one thing, and, right? And then case, case, sorry, case one, do something else, right? Case two, do something else. And so on, and so forth, right? And you would have to actually uh, then call fun, uh, f1, f2, strategy one, strategy two, strategy three, right? But then, if you the moment you have to add a fourth one, you you will have to modify. Not only will you have to write uh, the function somewhere, and you would also have to add a case statement here. None of that is necessary. You could be you could be building your strategies run at runtime through some other, some code execution and. And picking between them. Make sense? So, so yeah, so having function as values makes quite an interesting situation. Now, now that we know that functions can be values, let's go to the next level. Let's comment this out. So this is where we start talking about closures. So what are closures? So here, uh, you could have a function f1. Okay, let's say uh, we have a function called add five. Okay, what it does is if there is a variable called x which is equal to five, and you give it some parameter even and it will simply return even plus 
which happens to be a value of 5, right? So that's understandable, no big deal, right? Then, but, but so the thing is, the thing that makes it closure is that it you can reference an outside x is not local to this function and yet you can you can reference it okay you may say what's the big deal you can always reference any global variable right okay fine it gets better you can actually write another function one let's call it okay, which takes uh, which takes some uh, another parameter, let's say. Uh, let's say it take parameter P2. It, now you can say return P2 plus P1. Now this is definitely something you probably haven't seen in other languages. Or you haven't seen inner function, function inside function, but then this. So now, look, p1 is this p1. It was passed in as a parameter. Okay. And now I could uh, I could call. No, I mean I could call this function f1. With a parameter of let's say six. Now at this point, if I call f, sorry, not f one, I meant f two. This should have been no, it is f one five. If I now I call <coughs> add five with a parameter value of say twenty one, what will happen is the actual parameter is twenty one, so the formal parameter p one becomes twenty one. And then if if I call six, it will now put six here. Six plus twenty one. That's what it will return twenty seven. That's very peculiar because when the same function add five is called with let's say add five with the parameter of thirty one. And this is thirty one, this will going to return six plus thirty one. Same function f1, but it, but it is tweaking its behavior on the current value of this parameter. Now, whether this is useful or not, it certainly is remarkable, unusual. Uh -huh. So, so, so the thing is. Did you get it? This inner function's uh, behavior is completely dependent on the value of the current value of this parameter. So when you call at, at five the first time, this function behaves one way. You call it a, a second time, it behaves a different way. So. No, you cannot. It's simply not available. Right. So let's do this. Uh, let's say, okay, but I wanted to show you something else before I go there. L let's, let's get out of here. Uh, let me just close all this. I want to show you that add five is, is a little funky. Uh, imagine that you uh, did a, uh, wrote another function you said you know x is now 10 let's let me write a function add 10 okay. and what it does is return p1 plus x again but x is now 10 so it's going to add 10 to it not 5 correct now here's the problem Let's run it and we'll find out what the problem is. Run it. Obviously, we nobody has called add 5 or add 10, so let's call it add 
5 and we call it with a parameter 21 so we expect to, to get what back 26 right <laughs> we got 31 and if we say add 10 to 21 we get the same 31 so the lesson to be learned here is just because x used to be 5 when this function was defined and x used to be 10 when this function was defined they are not going to uh, the, the x is not a constant here so what you need to remember is the binding of add 5 to x is by reference not by value what does that mean that means it doesn't copy the value of 5 and use 5 every time. No, it actually goes back to the current value of x and uses that. So if you really wanted to copy the value of x, then you would have to do this. You would have to say var current value of x is take the value of x and copy it into current and then start using current. So now it will actually remember the value of x as it was at that moment in time when this function was defined. Now add 5 and add, add 10 will behave the way you want, expect them. Add 5. Oh, sorry. No. No, no, no. It didn't work. Uh-oh. What happened here? Copy the value, not a reference. Hmm. Uh oh, what happened here? Hmm. Okay, let's do this. Let's uh, actually. This is the perfect time to do some debugging. If I run, call add 5, the x, oh, wait, it is copying, yeah, so that won't work. Yeah, that makes sense, of course, because at that point in time, value of x has been changed. Yes, but I, yeah, I mean, obviously you're right. And no, that wouldn't make, yeah, that, that, that's one and the same. The, the, the problem is this. Every time the function is being called, it is actually referencing, once again, the current value of x, not, it's not like it, it remembers the old value. Okay. So, if you really wanted to make that, do, do it, then what you would have to do is this 5 and 10, etc. You would have to, uh, you would have to pass that in as a parameter. So, what you are going to pass would have to be passed in as a parameter. So, uh, so, what you could do is, you could write a function called add and it takes a parameter, uh, well, no, it doesn't take any parameter. It only takes x as a parameter. And then it returns, here's the fun part, return a function. Send me a function that will take a parameter p1 and returns 
T1 plus X. Okay. Now, you could write, you don't have to write any of these things. And you could write variable add 5, which is build me the add X function with 5. And variable add 10, build me the add X function with 10 as a parameter. So you see what is happening. This is not a function to add something. This is a function to build me. It's a factory of functions. Am I making sense? So we should not call this add X. We should say make add X. That's a more appropriate name for it. Make or create add X or something like that. So you're saying make me an add five, make me an add 10. So now, when you do that, and you say add five with parameter 21, it actually adds five. If you say add 10 with extra parameter 21, it actually adds 10. So did you see how add five and add five, 10 was never actually written as a function, they were simple variables and this function is being constructed at and you know being assigned to add 5. Now you can call add 5 21 and add 10 21 right and those obviously they, they work uh, you know they, they are getting called, they are simply not printing their values. So, if you really want to print the values, you would have to say console log okay. So, if you really print, say now it's doing the they, These things, this thing, a function inside a function is a, becomes a closure. They, then, so this is what a closure is. Now, it, it's a little, it will take some time for you to understand what closures really are and why they are so fantastic, why they are good. What is happening is this. The, this inner function, uh, is that inner function getting defined once or more than once? Hmm. Well, in reality, this function, well, you can ask yourself this question. How many times make add x is being called? Twice. So when make add x is being called twice, therefore the body of make add x has to be running. How many times? Twice. Therefore this function, even though you wrote the code for the function once, this function gets defined twice. <laughs> And each time it has a different uh, separate incarnation, separate instance of that function. And each time it binds itself to the current value of x. Okay, by the way, this x is irrelevant, so that might, we might as well delete it. it. It doesn't make any difference. It is this x that matters. And because the current value of x is 5 the first time around, and then 10 later time around. Now you have to understand one thing. In our previous example, the same x, var x was 5, and then later on we said x, oh now x is 10. The, the thing, the problem with that was that it is the same exact x that is being reassigned a new value. And that is, that was the source of our troubles. Now, in this situation, x is just a formal parameter. 
and even though it is called x both the times, it is not the same exact variable. When when make add x gets called twice, x is this, is called is the is given the same name yes both the time, but it's not the same exact variable. It's a different variable. It's a different value. Actually, okay. So that is the thing to be remembered. Now this whole thing makes. Uh, now it is still very hard for me to explain to you what the what is uh, the closure part of this. The closure part of this is that the func this anonymous function is closing around the current value of x. That's that's how they say it. They say that the inner function closes around the values of the local variables in the outer function. So if you had a var y equal to 15, let's say, right, then you could say this y. But if you wanted to increment y every time, you could, you could say plus plus y, and let's call it zero, right? So now, when you reload this, Okay. It's 27 and 32. Why? Because y got, uh, we were expecting 26, but now we are adding y and we are incrementing y first. So we were expecting 31 here, but we see 32. But if we call add 5 again with 21, we get 28. We call add 5 again with 21, we get 29, 20, 30. So because it is incrementing it's, it is remembering the value of y and then incrementing it. Y keeps going up. So that means, now, now this is very interesting. You should, I hope you understand how interesting this is. Y used to be a local variable of make add x, which means y came into existence exactly twice. Both, um, because you call make add x twice, right? Both the times y started out with the same value of 0, except that now, as we are calling add 5 repeatedly, y is making a guest appearance, a cameo, if you will. And y lives on, basically. As you can see, how calling add 5 keeps increasing the value that it is returning. The only reason why is because of why. So, in most cases, you would think that y was a local variable within make add x. So, it died at the end of make add x. It came into existence once and then twice. And that was it. But the funny thing is that y continues to live. Not only that, if we call add 10, did you notice how add 10 has a different conception of what y should be? Add 10 started with 32 here and now it's showing 33. It is not taking the, the value of y that add 5 was using. Because by now add 5 has progressed to five, uh, 9. The value of y is I think 4 or right? 4 or no. 5 or 6 basically. If you keep calling add 5 repeatedly, then add 5 will keep progressing further and further and further and further and further and further, and further right? But add 10 is still where it was. Add 10 is keeping its own copy of y. Okay, so this, what, what that means is, This, this value of y, uh, y came into existence twice, but then it lived on within this inner function. And that is another meaning of closure. Does that make sense? Yep, 
so this is so this now you may now all of this is great i mean this so far it's all remarkable interesting exciting all that but we don't know if it is useful yet okay so we have to make it actually useful now useful part of it comes when we start using ajax and function callbacks in ajax that's when all of this becomes super useful um but i think we should take that some other time we should stop and, and uh, you know because that that's ajax is a big issue uh, topic by itself um well what else about javascript language that i should talk about um, let me see so uh, what i would suggest is to learn closures obviously you know search for javascript closures on the internet i'm sure other people have come up with better examples than i have come up with uh, but but keep one thing in mind closure is the property of javascript functions inner function specifically where the outer function scope closes around the inner function basically the variables in the outer function they get copied into the inner function of course if the inner function is using them right not otherwise and then the inner function it remembers the values of those variables and uses them and maintains that value so it's sort of like state you know what we call stateful so the outer the surrounding state this is the surrounding state is copied into the inner function and then maintained separately for every invocation of the outer function because this outer function was called twice therefore you have two incarnations of this function and those two incarnations are keeping a separate value of y and this is why as pan you were saying our functions objects very much so yes they are objects and so much so that they are made keeping their own state oh there is something extremely important that i completely forgot about javascript language and that is prototypical inheritance i never i never got around to talking about prototypes i should talk about that in whatever time we have so here's what i want to tell you about prototypes okay so you have a function well hold on i think ah uh, yeah so let's say uh, you have r x it's a string i am a string right now you have r y it says i am also a string what you can do is you can attach because they are strings they actually x dot prototype and y dot prototype prototype is basically a no well, it's a it's a function table it's a list of functions or methods that are on string object and you can add stuff to the prototype of string in every string object in the universe or in this at least in this javascript interpreter will inherit it let me demonstrate that first of all let me just reload and say x x is this y is that x dot prototype and then that's a problem hold on string prototype oh there is string dot prototype never mind and there is okay so string has a method called 
zero. Okay, okay. So yeah, you don't refer to x dot prototype. You you refer to string dot prototype. So now, if I add a new function, say string dot prototype. So that is a list. That's an object full of functions. Okay, so which means I can add a new function to this called foo, and that is a function. Which will uh, let's say console dot log says whatever, and then in there you can actually print the value of this, which means the string itself. Let's see what happens now. Now that we we added this new function called foo as a property of strings prototype x and y simply received it automatically so now i can say x dot foo and it says foo says blah the, the string itself you see how it says i am a string let me say let me, let me say it's hard to read there let me let me write it here i could say string dot prototype dot foo this could be a function and so dot log Just to keep it simple. Now you can start calling x dot. This is completely legitimate. You can say y dot. Both x as well as y simply is inherited. They inherit the prototype. So this is called prototypical inheritance as opposed to object oriented inheritance. Isn't that funny? Isn't that interesting that every string object out there now has a method called foo? See? X and Y. Now, um, what is that primitive value or something like that? Right. So you could you could basically say and you could print. String I believe is what you're supposed to say. I'm not sure. Okay, let me see. <laughs> this is foo. I am a string. This is foo. I am also a string. The second one. Because the other one was uh, y. Remember? Y says I am also a string. Reload. This is foo. I am a string. This is foo. I am also a string. So the other thing that I am pointing out is that the, this reference does not point to string. This reference points to X or Y. Am I making sense? So, so whatever method you add to prototype, it becomes available on every object of that type. So you could you could create something called var n one equal to five, var n two is equal to six, right? Now you could say number. Remember that's a type. Number dot prototype dot square. Let's say. Function return this times this. So from here on, you can just call n one dot square and n two dot square. Let's see. Reload n one dot square twenty five n two dot square. 
obviously the number type did not actually have a method called square ahead of time. My code actually created that method. So this is pretty powerful, right? So now you, you not only not only you can create objects with new methods, more importantly, you can add new methods to existing object types. Does that make sense to you? I mean, you, uh, I, uh, at least you can see the how remarkable that is, right? You know, other other languages do not allow you to add methods to an existing object type. Right? They they may, I mean, if you define your own object type, yes, yeah, sure, you can add all the methods you want, but you cannot add methods to other people's object types. But that's exactly what you're doing here. You string and numbers are not your type. Your object types, that is, right? So, so that is something interesting. So now, the final piece. Uh, the, the the so we already referenced this this variable. So this, uh, I, we should call it this reference rather, not variable. This reference is always pointing to the receiver of the method. So. It, and the receiver of a method is whoever is in front of the dot. That's the receiver. Whatever precedes the dot is the receiver. And this always points to whoever precedes the dot. Okay. So now, now let's comment this one out as well because I am going to now show you uh, objects, functions as objects, and constructors, and all that good stuff. So here's here it comes. Um, let's say you wanted to create a class. Now this is object oriented programming in uh, JavaScript. Okay. You wanted to create a class of let's say vehicle or car or something, right? So if you wanted to create uh, I mean, generally, objects in JavaScript are like this, right? You say, yes. let's say you want to call this a car, car C1, right? But you have to give it, um, say, make. Mm, then you say model. Uh, the year. I mean, the problem with this is this you're just making stuff up on the fly. If you create another variable C2, you don't have to give it the same properties. You could give it properties of foo and bar. Right? Now, how can you say that these are two cars? First of all, they are not. But even if they both had make, model, and year, even then, it's there is nothing that tells you that they are of the same type, right? So generic objects in JavaScript, they don't have a type, a typeless objects. Now, if you really want, if you really want uh, types, you should do like this. You create a function called car. You may say what? But I don't want function, I want a class. Don't worry, you will get a class. And you say, this constructor of car, this function is the constructor. Takes make model year. Okay, and then you say this dot make is the, the this dot make assign that to the, uh, assign the formal parameter make to this. This dot model, assign it, again the formal parameter model. And this dot year is year. So now, the you may say, uh, what is this? What does this do really? The answer is, it's a function whose name becomes the name of the class that it will represent. 
and the function itself serves as the constructor of that class. Okay. Then, when you actually want to create cars of this type, you say var c1, instead of calling the function like this, you can call, of course, you can say Honda Civic. R C two R Toyota Camry Okay. The, uh, the only this is not making it. Uh, this won't work actually. If you try to do this, it won't work. Let's see. Reload. If I say C one. because this function doesn't return anything. So, to make this, there's only one thing that is missing in this, and that is a new operator. That's what you, what you will miss. So, because these are constructors, if you prefix the function with the new operator, up to this point, these were just function calls. They're just function calls, calling the function, the car, function and then giving it these parameters. The only problem is there is no this. By prefixing this with a new operator, what you are doing is you are saying create a new empty object, bind it to this and now run this function. So what happened is you created a new empty object, which of course is getting assigned to C1 also. That object dot make is the make that you supplied. That object dot model is the set model you supplied. And that object dot year is the year you supplied. But remember the fun part is that that object is being created afresh. So this one and this one are two different objects. Once you do this, Reload C1 is a car and C2 is a different car. So that does that start? Is it now looking like object oriented programming now? Or maybe not. Wait till you see this. Now you can give it some methods. This dot drive is a function. I am driving a this car. I'm driving a Honda, I'm driving a Toyota, whatever, right? Um, so, sorry, why am I calling it a function? Hold on, hold on. It's a function, sorry, sorry, function. Which, uh, by the way, sorry, no parameters and it prints console.log. That's what I mean. Okay. So, that means we created a, an anonymous function, simply prints console.log, uh, and it This is okay. Make sense what, what I'm doing here now? So, now once you do this, you reload. And uh, you can not only use C1 and C2, more importantly, you can say C1.drive and it says I'm driving a Honda or C2.drive. And you say I'm driving a Toyota. But it gets better. Rather than assigning it like this in the constructor, you can actually do it here. And you could say car dot prototype dot drive. So now all cars, all these cars, they share a prototype, right? Prototype is shared across all classes. So, and you added a method to the prototype, therefore all cars automatically got received this method called drive. So, if you reload, 
again you can drive C1 or you can drive C2 also which means not only can you add new methods inside the constructor like we did earlier you can add methods outside through prototype which means you can add methods even at a much later time not only can you add these methods after the, the constructor has been defined heck you can even add methods after the object itself has been defined instantiated i hope you understand the remarkableness of this where c1 and c2 have already been instantiated and then you are adding methods to the prototype and c1 and c2 automatically still receive it let me show you that which means this car dot prototype dot drive could have been added much 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 later maybe it was loaded from another javascript file maybe it was loaded uh, over ajax all of those things are possible and in other words you are adding methods to existing classes you know on demand so that's the meaning of prototype Am I making sense? Okay. Now, uh, do you? Well, one of the biggest problems is sometimes when you see something interesting, you don't realize that it is interesting. When you see something remarkable, you don't realize it's remarkable. The reason why is because you don't. You, I mean, obviously, if you haven't seen many many other languages, you won't find how remarkable. You won't know how remarkable something is. Because other languages don't have this, so I find these things remarkable. That's one thing. The second thing is I also find I know the usefulness of these features. So being remarkable is not enough. You also have to have a good use for it. And again, you know, as you gain more experience with uh, programming, you'll see how useful these things are. For now, you just have to take my word for it. I think we should stop now. Any other any points to make? Anything to react to? So we looked at uh, basic data types. We looked at arrays and object type, generic object types. Then we looked at closures. Then we looked at prototype typical inheritance. And finally, we looked at actual typed objects so if javascript typed objects are simply functions you just write a function that function becomes a that function becomes a constructor and then you in that constructor you simply take some parameters and initialize the object in whatever way you want then when you instantiate objects, you just say the function name and you call the function like any other function, except that you put new in front of it. This new is what makes this possible. Otherwise, in the, in the absence of, of new, in the absence of the new, this doesn't exist. There is no this. But only with new, you get a new this. And, uh, and then, at any point in time, you can add methods to the prototype of that function. And all the instances of that object type, they receive that same function, same method. That's, so this is, uh, I mean, you, you, you can do some serious amount of object oriented programming now, right? Now that you have all these tools. Sorry? Somebody said something? Okay, maybe I, th I thought someone was asking some, something. All right then. <laughs>